Isaiah chapter 43. In this chapter, if I can summarize it, we're continuing to look at, uh, obviously, Israel, uh, Jacob, and how they have sinned against the Lord through idols, uh, creating themselves little gods, putting their faith and their trust in these gods, hoping that these objects will deliver them from uh, whatever calamities that they might be in. And God is reminding Israel that he is their redeemer, that he redeems them and has always redeemed them, just as he had called them into a personal relationship with God Almighty, Jehovah. He has also redeemed them from the hand or the nation Egypt, pulling them out of this bondage and setting them free to serve God. And so God is reminding them of his great power and strength in his province and his sovereignty in these places. And so as we go through chapter 43, we're going to see Babylon uh, not rised yet, but rising to power is probably a a nation that that, uh, is comparable to other surrounding nations, but not really in power yet like the Assyrians. And so, but it's rising to power and he will be talking in these three chapters about Babylon, who will eventually be in power and take the nation Israel into captivity. But then they will be delivered by a king, Cyrus, a Gentile king, who God uses to free his people from Babylon. So we'll see Cush, Egypt, Israel, and all this is taking place there in Jerusalem. So the Lord comforts Israel to begin with here in chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, And he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Judah had good reason to be afraid of Babylon, the army. It was very powerful. It was very mighty. And when you look at a nation like that who is threatening to attack you and to capture you, yeah, there's fear that comes along. And God is here comforting the children of Israel to remind them that it's I who created you, Jacob. I am the one who made you. If you go back to Genesis, you can see in the book of Genesis that I created mankind. I took nothing and I created something out of it. That's power. That's strength. And when you understand and know that that's the God that we serve, then you can have comfort in him. Because he took nothing and he created into something. He created a man. And then he created a woman from the side of man. And when you understand that, then you can trust him that he has you in his hands. And you can find comfort in that, that God is so powerful that he can take nothing, create into something, and thus he can protect you from his enemy. And so you don't have to fear, as he says here, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Now, redeeming them from Egypt, redeeming them from the enemy, redeeming them from themselves. This is the God that we serve, a God of redemption, a God of always trying to restore us in a right relationship with him. In Egypt, they were in rebelliousness against God, and so God put them into Egypt for 470 years to serve in captivity as an example to the other nations that God is a merciful God, a compassionate God, a loving God, a God that does not forget, and he didn't forget his people. Because after 470 years of dealing with the nations and being merciful to them, then he goes to Israel and he redeems them from the hands of Pharaoh and took them and put them on a right track. God said, I have redeemed you. A a redeemer was one who paid, uh, paid for the slavery or the debt of that slave, uh, on their behalf to free them from whatever debt or from whatever captivity that they were in. And so if you had somebody that, that didn't have enough resources and, and they knew that they needed uh, resources, they would sell themselves to someone and they would become their slaves for a price. And then they would take that money and they'd give it to their family so their family could, could continue to live and, and prosper and hopefully invest and, and it would probably grow. And after so many years, that person then would be set free and they would be able to go back to their family. Oftentimes what happens is, is if they prosper enough, they could come and they take some of the resources and they can pay the person back and then that person is set free. And Jesus is, or God is saying here that he has redeemed Israel from Egypt. He has redeemed Israel from the enemy. He is their redeemer. He paid the price. And of course, we know that, that in the um, 
New Testament, it was Jesus Christ who pray, paid the ultimate price for our redemption. Because we were once lost, right? We were alienated from God. We were in captivity to the world, to the culture, to the lust of the world. And God came and he redeemed us from the world. He took us and he opened up our eyes so that we could make a choice uh, to receive him. The ultimate price was his son on the cross. He paid the debt. He paid the penalty of sin, which is death. And so he had to die. And he died in our place. So comfort yourselves that I have redeemed you. You don't have to fear because I created you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Now, obviously, I think of the Red Sea, you know, and I think of that great scene um, of how God delivered them to the waters. I mean, here he is taking them out of Egypt, right, uh, in a mightily way. These plagues that he would put upon Egypt and force Pharaoh to, to let go of the children of Israel and then to bring them right to the Red Sea, right at that spot. Now, who was in control? God was in control. He was in control of the whole thing, and he brings them right to the spot where he wants them so that they will activate their faith and trust in him. Because they had nowhere to go. They saw Pharaoh coming to get them because eventually Pharaoh says, what am I doing? Let's go get them. Let's kill them. Let's wipe them off the face of the earth. And so they're going after them with their chariots and horsemen and armory. And Israel sees it. And then they see the Red Sea. And they say, we're doomed. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? We can't fight. Millions of people. And they can't fight. They're not going to be able to defeat Pharaoh. And so in a sense, they lost hope. They gave up. They, weren't, they didn't have the faith in order to uh, defeat Pharaoh. But Moses had faith, and he cried out to God. And God directed Moses and said, I want you to part the Red Sea. And so there they are. God puts them in that place, and they're crying, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, you know. Moses, why did you bring us here? Better if we die in, in, in Egypt. At least we'd have been buried there. You know, but here we are. And then God divides the Red Sea. Could you imagine that? I mean, that should have built your faith, right? That should have strengthened you to see all of a sudden this, this Red Sea just begin to open up. The waters just divide. Now, whether there were walls, some suggest that uh, there was an area there in the Red Sea that, that had a, um, uh, an area that was kind of built up so the water wasn't as deep and so it just kind of pushed its way off to the sides and they could walk right through. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, but we don't know because we weren't there. But somehow God divided it and they walked through it, you know, and that took faith. I think that was probably just as scary as, as Pharaoh coming at them. As you see these walls of water just divided, I mean, when are they coming down, <laughs> you know? And if we walk through this, will God keep them divided, you know, as we're walking through? Or will, will all of a sudden they collapse on us at the very last minute? And that's how we think, isn't it? Even at the last minute, we're still thinking, is he going to let it collapse on us, you know? And they all get through. And then Pharaoh's running through, and then God just collapsed the whole sea upon him. Who's in control? God is. That's the God that we serve, the God that we should trust in for our very lives. That is the God who will watch over us. He's still watching over us. He still loves us. And he's, he has a plan and a purpose for us. And so he says, I will be with you. I will be with you. Those are words of promise there. I will be with you. Someone said, you want evidence that there is a God? Look at Israel. It's evidence enough. God promised to be with them. And he's still with them. And they're still prospering. And God's still going to protect them. And though the rivers, they shall not overflow you when you walk through the, the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Now, I think of the three Hebrew boys there, right? Another evidence of God protecting them, that they wouldn't be scorched or burned. You know, when I read stuff like this, I go, wow, that's an awesome God. And then I think in my, in my head, I think, why doesn't he do that for me? <laughs> you know, why am I scorched? Why am I burned? Why is it that I get in trouble? You know, and how come I'm not, you know, not getting scorched and not getting burned? It's because of my lack of faith. It's because I'm not totally trusting in him. And when we totally trust in him and, and, and realize he's our total sufficiency and we just lay it at his feet, it's amazing what he'll do when, he, when we just do that, when we just let it go and let God have it completely. These Hebrew boys let it go, right? I mean, they totally let it go. What did they say when they were ready to be thrown into this oven? It says, look, if our God wants to, he'll deliver us. No problem. But if he wants to take us, he will take us. We'll die. 
No problem, because they understood who God was, that he was sovereign and he was in total control. And so they pretty much let it go. They let it go. I remember um, earlier on in my walk with the Lord, and I realized that God was using me, and I was a little fearful because I've heard studies and stories about how God will sometimes take things away from you in order to use you. Um, sometimes he'll allow things in your life in order to build your faith. And boy, has he done all those things. But I was fearful that he was going to take everything away from me. I was fearful that he'd take my house just to teach us a lesson on faith. I was fearful he'd take our children because he'd teach us a lesson on faith. I remember hearing a story that Dobson told about a pastor who felt that the Lord was calling him to ministry, sold everything he had, moved to California. He was promised a job. And when he got here, the guy said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't give you that job. And he lost everything, lost everything. You know, the guy was devastated. And I would hear stories like that, and, and I would think to myself, what am I doing? <laughs> Do I really want to go down this path? Do I really want to experience these things? You know, and God continued to remind me that I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm always there with you. And even if you lose your house... I'll always provide for you. It's just a house. It's going to burn. And in 100 years, you'll be in heaven, and your house won't be around anyway. You know. And same with your children. If you lose your children, they're in heaven with me. So you have to have faith in me. And really, that's what got me through, is knowing who my God was, that he's able to do those things. It's all in his hands. For I am the Lord your God, he tells Israel, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I gave Egypt. For your ransom, Ethiopia, Sheba, in your place, since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Now, we see this in the New Testament, don't we? Where John tells us that God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God is telling the children of Israel, you're precious in my sight. I love you so much. I love you so much that I will give men for you. I will take their lives for your life. You know, I will punish them or devour them just for you. I will protect you. I will guide you. I will lead you. I will be a hedge. I will be a refuge. I'll be a strong tower for you completely because I love you. We serve a God that loves us, loves us completely, and he will remove others from us because he loves us completely. How do we know he loves us? Look at the cross. Look at what he did through his son, Jesus Christ. How do we know that he loves me? How do we know that? Again, the cross for you. For you and you alone. He died on the cross so that your sins would be wiped out. So that you could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how much he loves you. He promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He promised that he would send someone to take your place. He would sacrifice his son for you. That's how much he loved us. For God so loved the world. He loved the world. And that's available to the whole world. It's available to the world. It's good news. And we should be sharing that good news with others, with our friends and our neighbors. Why do we share? Because it's good news. You know, well, but I get embarrassed. Then something's wrong with your faith. Something's wrong with your relationship with Christ. You shouldn't get embarrassed. It should be the most precious thing in your sight, just as we are the most precious thing in His sight. Jesus even said, if you deny me before my Father... I'll deny you before my father. He says, but if you proclaim me, I will proclaim you. You We shouldn't be embarrassed. We should be rejoicing. We should be standing up. And those three little Hebrew boys, they were powerful witnesses. Some suggest that they were teenagers. How can teenagers do something like that? How can they profess their faith? How can they stand up and proclaim it? How can they share the good news? How can evangelists die for this? How did Peter die for it? The apostles die, and some of our forefathers who were martyrs for it. Why would they even die for something like this? Because it's good news. Because the Spirit of God had indwelled them, and they believed it, and they lived it, and they knew that their life depended on it. I mean, it changed them completely. That's why the three Hebrew boys could do that, because God was real to them. He was real. 
See, our youth today, it's not real to them anymore. Because of a society that we live in, because of Google, because of the teachers that are teaching them in the public schools that deny Christianity, deny religion, so that you can do it yourself, and of course they realize they can't do it themselves. And if God isn't going to do it, then he must not be real. So they don't believe in that God because he's not real to them. So there's no power, there's no relationship because they're not seeking out that relationship or power. They really don't want God. You know, they're walking away from God and they're walking towards the culture. They're believing what humanity has said and it's a lie and it's leading them right down to hell. Instead of get, picking up the word of God and trusting the word of God and believing the word of God, this is the only way that our nation, that our children, that our families are going to, to cause revival to start in this land. You know, we have a, a saying for our church, and it's uh, strengthening our communities by building strong families one person at a time. The only way that our nation is going to change it's through the families, through the families. Them rising up and taking their rightful place. See, the world doesn't care about our families. They don't care if it's, they're divided. They don't care if they're, if they're allowing laws to create homosexual families or atheist families. They don't care about that because you destroy the families, you've got control of the world. But you build families and strong families, you can change the world completely. If you can get one person... If you get one man as a leader to lead his family, to lead his wife, and his wife submit to his husband and respect his husband and honor his husband, and then they start reading and having devotions and praying and seeking God and going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, and when those doors are open because they're fully devoted to God, believe me, their family will change. They will change completely, and those around them will change when you apply the scriptures to your life. And then those boys will raise, uh, be raised up, and they'll go to school, and then they'll become political leaders, and then they get into the political system, and it just changes the whole world. There's still hope for us if men would just turn away from their wicked ways, repent, and turn back to the fundamental principles of Christianity. You know, our forefathers left us the monument as I said, and you have faith, and then you have three other statutes at the bottom there, and it's actually a blueprint on how to restore our nation. They did it for a reason, because they knew that eventually our country would push away from the Constitution, and we would then have another battle, a war, to fight for that freedom that we had as a great nation, and we would then return to our founding fathers and what they had set up and the way that we would do that is by the blueprint of this monument that we have there. Check out that monument, the National Monument. It's really interesting. Uh, you have that, uh, what is it, the guy that's sitting in the next place that's talking about morality because you have faith in God, you need faith in God holding the Bible in, his, in her hands because that's where we get our faith and the trust in God, the Bible, not other religions, the Bible itself. So our faith is based upon the word of God. And, they're, and she's looking up to God, getting her wisdom and knowledge from God. And then the next layer is morality. And you see this man, he's got no eyes. And the reason he has no eyes is because morality starts within the heart. It looks to you, not to everyone else. When you begin to act more in a moral way, when you apply the word, because he has the Ten Commandments and he has the book of Revelation, speaking of the whole Bible, and you look into yourself, then morality comes. And it has a, a, a little picture on the side of an evangelist. Because through evangelism, you rebuild your nation. Through evangelism, you share the gospel, which goes out to the world. People are changed, political or not. They are changed with a right heart to look at the Constitution through the spiritual eyes, not through atheist eyes, that's why the Constitution doesn't make sense to this world. Because their, their eyes are blinded to the truth. When you look at the Constitution, you have to look at it through the Word of God, because it's the Word of God, and so they're blinded. And that's why you get people who read this book, and they're going, it doesn't make any sense. You need to get born again. You need the Spirit of God in your heart, if it's not making any sense. The only way this book can make sense is if you're born again, the Spirit dwells within you and He illuminates the Word of God. Otherwise, it won't make any sense. Otherwise, you won't have faith. You won't have trust in Him. Otherwise, you'll be bored when you're sitting here in church because you're like, oh, when am I going to get out of here? Where's your faith? Where's your love for the Word? Where's your love for God? 
That's the question in these last days that we should be asking ourselves. We need to close our eyes and look inward and use the word of God to judge our own hearts. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15, that uh, we need to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith or not. That's where it starts. This nation isn't uh, gone yet, but it's precious in God's sight because through this nation, God has done some great works in the world, in the world. It's not our government, guys. It's not our officials. It is God's people who have allowed this to happen. Second Chronicles 17, 14 says it, right? Very, very clear. We have to turn from our wicked ways. We have to turn from our wicked ways and we have to stand for righteousness now. He loves us. He loves us all. He says, fear not for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Again, speaking of his sovereignty, his power, his authority, him being God, everything, everyone, he created it all. That's the God that we serve. Why do you fear? Why do you fear? Because you take your eyes off of God. You put your eyes on the situation. And when your eyes are on situations, yeah, you'll fear. The three Hebrew boys could have said, oh, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. There's fire. And we're going to get consumed. They didn't say that, though, because they knew their God. Hey, big deal. We'll go heaven. We'll be there sooner. Praise God. We won't have to be here with Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar and these people. We don't have to see all this. We get to go to heaven. Yay. Good thing. Let's do it. You know? And they walked in there like, let's go. And they're probably dragging the guards. Come on, guys. Move. Hurry up. You know? And as soon as they get close, boom, they're consumed. But God's people go right in through the fire. And they're not even touched. Because they had faith on God and not on the situation. Take your eyes off the situation. Take your eyes off of what's going on around you. Put them on God. Have faith in God, and God will do great things. Listen to Revelation 21.5. Then he sat down on the throne, and he said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You can't argue with that. It's the word of God. God said these things are true and faithful. In other words, they're not a lie. I'm not just saying it to say it. I am making everything new. Okay, well, when does that happen? Like when the tribulation starts, then things start getting... No, right now. He's been doing it since Genesis. When he told the woman, I'll take your seed and I will bring the Messiah in and he will crush the serpent's head. From that point on, he's making all things new. He's working in your life, making things new because he loves you and he has great works for you. All things are being made new. And you can trust and have faith in that. Romans 8, 27. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. He, 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 he did it all. He justified you. You can't do it. None of you can do it. He justified us. He made us righteous through his son, Jesus Christ. It's nothing that we can work for. That's awesome. He glorifies us. There's nothing that we can do to get to heaven or even get there with wonderful works by working on here on this earth as hard as we can so we can go up to heaven and say, hey, look what we've done. We can't even do that. It's his work in us if we just love him. If we just love him. You know, we have the Ten Commandments, you know, from love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength all the way down to the very bottom that we are not to covet our neighbor's goods you know, and in between that, going to church, uh, not taking God's name in vain, uh, not stealing, not committing adultery, not lying and so forth. And then Jesus sums it all up and says what? This is the commandment. Just love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Love God. Just love God. And you don't have to worry about commandments. Love your neighbor and you don't have to worry and you, thus you fulfill the whole law. Because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to harm your neighbor. In fact, you're going to take a 
position of humility towards your brother. You're not going to demand your way. You're not going to look at things like, they wronged me. That's injustice. Oh yeah, talk and share. But you know what? That's okay. God's in control of my life. God's here. I'm just going to love as Christ loved. You know? He came to his people and his people rejected him. But he still loved them. Still performed miracles. Still reached out to them as much as he could. He's working all things out for good. Bringing out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled who among them can declare this and show us former things. Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is true. So they, the idea here is that the people are to defend themselves in their worship of idols. Israel was worshiping idols. And in a sense, they are deaf and they're dumb. They're blind because they truly don't see the God that they really serve, the God who has created them, the God who has delivered them. He says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God form, nor shall there be after me. I Even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. There's only one God, and there are no other gods, and nor will there ever be any other gods. He's the only God there is. Every other religion, every other system is false. It's all false. Isaiah's proclaiming that right here, and he's going to continue to proclaim it in the next few chapters. That there's one God, and God is saying, I'm him. I have all authority. I have all power. You have idols? Really? I'm the only God, not your idols. Not what you put your faith and trust in. What do you put your faith and trust in? You know, you might say, well, we don't have idols today. Are you sure? We're a little more intellectual. We create our idols in our heads. Do you know that a lot of us worship our own wisdom and intellect? What do you mean? Well, I know better than God. Let's do this. I know God said to trust and have faith in Him, but let me just handle this and take control of it. It'll work out. Who are you worshiping? Your own wisdom and intellect and not God. Why not just say, God, you take it and you do what you want and I'll trust in you and watch you work. Then glorify God. And God is saying, look, in your intellect and your decision making and you thinking you're doing what you're doing and it's going to work, I'm God. <laughs> I created you. Uh, you're not God, nor are there any other gods, nor will there ever be gods. I'm God alone. I know beginning to end. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I already know what tomorrow brings. I already know what you're going to say tomorrow. I already know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's the God that we serve. And how dare we think that we have control of our lives, that we can create destiny for ourselves. You can't. God's in total control. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the days was, I am He. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand, I work, and, and who will reserve it. So again, before the days was, before anything existed, there was God, and that's Him. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships, again, their own power, their own strength. So I'm going to bring them all down because I'm God. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariots and horses, the armies of, and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. You get a candle, you got a little wick, and you light it, and it's fire. That fire can start a great forest fire. That fire can burn. It hurts to put your finger over it, and God can just whoop, snuff it out, and it doesn't do anything. He can take your ships, he can take your power, he can take your wisdom, it's nothing. Your ships would be turned over that quick. 
I can divide the Red Sea. Don't worry. It's divided. Go, move. I can divide the Jordan. Take steps of faith. Get into the Jordan. I divide the Jordan and then move. And, and God said, now leave a monument so you remember this and your children remember this, that I have done this, the God that you serve. Now, Isaiah here is prophesying of the future. He's prophesying of Babylon becoming a world power and then eventually uh, taking Judah into captivity. But then God says, but then I'll take care of them and they will be destroyed by King Cyrus. And so he goes on and he says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, verse 19, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed, my, I have formed myself, for myself. They shall declare my praise. God formed Israel for himself. He, he chose Abraham out of the, the group of Chaldeans there and says, Abraham, through you I am going to build a great nation. Through you. And he did. A mighty nation. You can't number it. You know, and God is still working in that name because he formed them for himself. The Old Testament says that Israel is God's wife. The New Testament says that the church is Jesus' bride. You know, same principle there. We're God's. He formed us. He created us. And he did the work that what? That we would be, declare his praises. It's not what God wants from us is to declare his praises, his wonderful glories. And now we come to 44. For God's blessings upon Israel. And again, he, he continues on with this foolishness of idolatry. It, it's, um, it's foolishness to think that you can worship God in other ways. Yet, hear now, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb. Who will help you? Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Now, Jeshurun means upright, and it's usually a reference to Judah. Or, I'm sorry, to Israel there. And again, here, you're my servant. I've chosen you. Don't fear. I've got things in control. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessings on your offsprings. Isaiah says... I will pour my spirit on your descendants. They will have my spirits and they will understand my truth. We need the spirit of God. It is the spirit of God that empowers us and strengthens us. It's the spirit of God that gives us faith. It's the spirit of God that distributes the gifts and diversities of kinds. It's the spirit of God that reveals all truth uh, to us. He is our teacher. We need the spirit of God. In the New Testament, it tells us that we need to pray for the Holy Spirit that we need to ask for the Holy Spirit and we need the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We need to do more of that, more of that Holy Spirit. And then you, in the Old Testament, this God gave the Spirit to people and then he would take that Spirit away from them. In the New Testament, that's not what happens. God gives you the Holy Spirit. He comes inside you. He seals you to the day of redemption and he's with you always. And he's on everyone. In the Old Testament, he was only given to certain people. And the rest of the people did not have the spirit. And they had to follow that man, that prophet, that person that God was using at that time who was filled with the spirit, who was revealing to him the revelations of God, the direction of God, and so forth, the plan of God. It's only through the spirit. We need the spirit. It's the spirit that gives us power, that deutimus that Acts talks about, to be witness, to be bold. It's the spirit of God that we need. We still need it today. Spurgeon said, without the spirit of God, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. We are, this is as he says, we are as ships without wind. Get that picture. Ships without wind. You're just not going anywhere. Uh, chariots without steeds. Like branches without sap, we are withered. Like coals without fire, we are useless. As an offering without the sacrificial flame, we are unaccepted. I desire both to feel and to confess this fact whenever I attempt to preach. I do not wish to get away from it or to concede it, nor can I, for I am often made to feel it to the deep humbling of my spirit. And so he's saying without the spirit of God, we cannot do anything, not one thing. In fact, we're not even acceptable to the Lord. And whether he's preaching, and I agree with him 100%, I don't know 
uh, in my own strength and power, I'm still asked the question, why am I up here? And if anything good comes out of this and I see that it does, it's the Spirit of God doing it and all glory goes to Him and not me. I receive that. Now, I know that people will oftentimes not believe me and they'll accuse me of lying, but that's how I feel in my heart. I'm just an instrument and a tool of the Spirit of God. And any confidence that comes up here is not my own confidence, but it's the confidence of God's Spirit. I remember um, I've never been asked to speak anywhere. And I got asked to speak in um, a couple's uh, Valentine's dinner uh, this year. And when I first was asked, I'm thinking, Do, they don't even know if I can teach. <laughs> you know, that's what I first thought. Uh, you know, they don't even know I can't, that I can't teach. And I'm like, why are they asking me? And I fe- kind of felt uncomfortable. I, but then at the same time, I want to tell them no. And then at the same time, God's saying, you know, telling me, walk by faith. And what I give, give for you to do, you do it. And so I walked in there believing that God had a purpose for it. And I got up there, and it was like I was teaching here. You know? And I just felt like the Spirit of God was on me. It wasn't me. And now I got asked again to teach on a Sunday morning. And again, the confidence is the Lord. The confidence is that God is the one uh, giving me that confidence. And, and I, I started a message already for it, and then all of a sudden I'm... Um, watching or actually reading this book and, and they're using the same scriptures that I was going to use already. And I'm like, the Lord's already confirmed it. You know? and, and so it's the Spirit of God leading you and directing you and guiding you. You can't do a thing without the Spirit of God. We need to believe that. When you're doing it in your own strength, guess what? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're going to be shipwrecked, like he says. A ship without wind. You're not going to go anywhere. You know? Spirit of God. They will, they will spring up, verse 4, among the grass like willows by the water course. One will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Another will write in his hand the Lord's and name himself in the name of Israel. Um, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and this Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no other God. He's really making this point, really making this point. I wonder what the Mormons think when they read stuff like that. Or the Jehovah Witnesses. What do they think? There's only one God and there are no other gods. I always throw this in the face of Jehovah Witnesses. I'll, I'll ask them, who's Michael the Archangel? Who's Michael the Archangel? They're like, well, he's Jesus. Okay. Well, at least you admit that. At least you admit that. Now, how many gods are there? And they go, one, Jehovah God. Really? Let's go to John chapter 1. In the beginning... Or it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what the Scriptures say. In their Bible, it says the Word was a God. And so I always bring that up. It says, you say there's only one God? Then why are you saying in, the, in 1 John there's a bunch of gods? We are? Where? Well, you said he's a God. That means a God means more gods. So you believe there's a lot of gods? No, we don't believe that. Well, well, you have to understand the Greek and the, the, the Greek. No. See, they can't deal with it. I remember we were at a youth night uh, one time. I think Roman was there with a bunch of his friends, and we were reading uh, Isaiah. And I was happening to be reading these chapters here, and there was a Mormon guy there from the school, very athletic person, very popular, and he was there. And I came across that, and I read it, and I said, stop, because I knew he was Mormon. I said, stop. It says, I'm the first and the last and I am, and besides me, there is no other gods, nor there will ever be any other gods. And I asked the Mormon guy, what does that mean? Because you guys believe that there are a lot of gods. In fact, one day you will be God, and you'll have your own planet, planet and you'll populate it, right? He says, well, yeah. I said, so what does that say? I said, could you read it out loud for us? And so he was trying to read it. He couldn't even read it. He was like, uh, one God only I'm like, what does that mean? And he, he could not interpret it. He was so blind, it was so evident that he could not even see what it was saying. That's a person without the Spirit of God. See, a person with the Spirit of God understands that completely. There's only one God, and there will never be any other gods. And he's the God that we serve. And it was amazing that he was that blinded. I was blown away by it because I'd never experienced anything like that before. Who can proclaim this as I do? Let, then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the thing that are coming shall come, let them show these to the end. 
Do not fear, do not be afraid. Have I not told you from, ta- from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Now, he's going to use these words, rock. Uh, who's Jesus? Our rock, you know? And who's our Savior? Jesus. But here, there's going to be a reference in a minute to God being our Savior. And so you get the Trinity within the scriptures there. Those who make an image of all them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? I mean, that's a question. It's a logical question, and God is asking this to people. Who would even do that? Who, who of you would, would take a piece of wood and make a God and then go, I trust in you. Help me out of this problem. Please, please. And you have this little piece of wood on top of your fireplace and you put little food there, little bowl of rice. Please eat, eat. Have as much as you want so that you can help me be prosperous. Please help me, help me. Who would do that? We wouldn't do that, would we? We wouldn't do that at all. Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with his tongs work one in the coal, fashions it with a hammer and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He makes one out of chalk. He fashions it with the plane. He marks it out with the compass. He makes it like the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man. It may remain in the house. He cuts down cedars for himself. He takes the cypress and the oak. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a a god and worships it. He makes it in a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat and he roast a roast and he's satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warmed. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. His carved image, he falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my god. They do not know nor understand. Those men are foolish. They're foolish. They go out to the forest and they go, oh, that's a nice tree. Let's cut it down. And they take half of it and they put it in the fire. Oh, I'm warmed up by the fire. It feels good. You know, cook a little meal, eat a little food, take another little bit of that thing, make a little image, make little figures like men because God has to be like us because we're gods, you know. And let's put them up there and then deliver me from my enemy. That's foolishness. That's foolishness for us to think that way. And he says they don't understand. They really don't understand. Uh, today in our world, we put our faith and trust in, in humanity, in human knowledge, in science. I hear that a lot, science. Science is our answer. Science is our God. And of course, science is no longer science. Science is more of a faith. It's more of a religion now because it's science that gives us all the answers. There's no God. We've proven it. Evolution is how we came here, not, not through the creation of God. Yet God in Isaiah all over the place is saying, God created you. God formed you. I was there before you. I mean, all over the place you see that God created us. This is, you know, hundreds of years after Genesis, and they believed that God was the one that created them. And here we are thinking, no, science. And science has proven that Big Bang happened, and through chemical reactions we came about. You know, and that's why our world is dying today. That's why we have people who teach in universities and said we're overpopulated. You know, uh, Jacques Cousteau used to say that. He says, we need to get rid of people. He says, we need to probably have only about 10% of the people that are here. Maybe uh, something like, uh, you know, 800 million or so kill everyone else. Basically what he was saying. Because we need the resources for those group of people. Now, how could he say that? How could he say that? Another professor that I just heard (laughs) brought up the deal that, that we need to wipe out at least... 5 billion people so that the 1 billion that we have can survive on this earth. How can a person say that and teach it to its pupils? Because they don't believe that humans have value. 
They don't believe that humans are made in the image of God. And because they're in the image of God, there's this respect and love for one another. And so for them, it's just like a squashing an ant or a cockroach or a rat. Let's just wipe out 4 billion people, 5 billion people. They're nothing anyway. That's science for you, you know, because we all evolved into the, what we are today. That's not what God says. God says, I love every single one of them, and in every one of them were made in my image. They don't understand. That's what he said in verse 18. They do not understand. For he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread. On its coals, I have roasted meat and eaten it, and I shall make the rest of it an abomination. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? I mean, it's almost ridiculous. He feeds on ashes. Uh, A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there any, or is there not a lie in my right hand? Uh, We still have this today. You have the tree huggers, you know, they just love nature and so forth, and, you know, Shirley McCain used to say, everything is God. You're sitting on God in those chairs because God is everywhere. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgression and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heaven, for the Lord has done it. Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into sing, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of a babbler and drives dividers mad who turns wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, you shall be inhabited, to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up the rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Now he mentions Cyrus here and he calls him a shepherd. This is not a Jew. This is a king. You notice that he says, who dries up the dry, who dries up the deep, the rivers, the waters? God does. You know, sometimes I, I understand when we have catastrophes in our world and I hear pastors say, oh, it was, it was, you know, we don't want to blame God, you know, because God isn't like that. Really? God dries up the land. God causes the water to pour. God uses an ungodly king like Cyrus, turns him into a shepherd to to save his people. Why not? God is going to judge this world, and he gives us correction from time to time. Katrina, I think it was an act of God. These hurricanes, these tsunamis are acts of God. God is getting ready to bring judgment upon the world, and he's revealing himself. And we get, sometimes we get these pastors that get up there and say, well, we don't want to blame God, you know. This is just nature. It, it just happens. You know, God is in total control and He's working things out for good. He's allowing these things to happen. So He calls Cyrus and He mentions him there. Um, he announces His name. 200 years before Cyrus even is, is going to come into the history. Can you imagine the people reading this going, who's Cyrus? Have you heard of Cyrus? No, I don't know who he's talking about. Do we know King Cyrus anywhere? Nope, don't know anybody. What is he talking about then, Cyrus? I have no idea what he's talking about. They had no, no idea whatsoever, and it wasn't for the, until the future that they understood who Cyrus was. Because our God knows the future, right? Get your eyes off the circumstances. Get your eyes on God. It's God who knows what tomorrow brings. You don't. You have no clue. You can worry. You can make your hair white. (laughs) You know, you you can't even lose the height that you have. You know, turn one hair black or even count the numbers. You know, God knows everything. And here we're worrying as though God can't do it. You know what you're saying? You're saying, God, you're not big enough. In fact, you're saying, 
you're saying that you don't believe in the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible is a deliverer, a redeemer, a God who helps. That's the God of the Bible. The God that you believe in is a totally different God. He's a God that can't help. He's, he's a God of your own imagination. That's not the God we serve. Now, I understand that's not who you believe in, and you know it. It's your lack of faith in him is really what the situation is. Get that faith, trust in him, know who he is, build it up. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Cyrus is anointed? This is, this is a non-Jewish king, and God puts his spirit inside of him. This blows me away, because it tells me God can do whatever he wants to do. He can put his spirit in Obama. <laughs> now that's hard to understand and even fathom, but he could if he wanted to. And move him in any direction that he wanted. So he puts a spirit upon him whose right hand I have held. Who held his hand? God. To subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings. To open before him a double door so that the gates will not be shut. What he's talking about here is that God is going to literally take his hands, give him wisdom to enter into Babylon. Now, history tells us that Babylon was walled around everywhere. They even walled where the river came into Babylon for their, you know, water needs. And, and they had gates so that they could close them at night and no enemy could come in. Well, God told Cyrus, this is what you're going to do. Now, of course, Cyrus is thinking this in his own head, right? You've got to remember this. Cyrus is thinking, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to dam up the river. And then when the water subsides, we're going to... Go into the gates. Oh, but the gates closed. How are we going to get through there? God said, and God's just laying this on Cyrus's heart, and he's thinking he's doing it himself, but God's got his hands and just guiding him all over the place, you know? I like that new commercial about the Sprint where, uh, or, or some sort of uh, wireless system, and the guy's wife and kids are, are, are um, puppets. They got strings, and they're like, what kind of strings are tied? Dad, you love me, don't you? And I have strings. Oh, son, you're okay. And then all of a sudden, he's flying in the fan because the strings got caught. He's, well, son, you're okay. Look, you can do that. I can't do that. And he's spinning around out there. God has Cyrus like a puppet, and he's using him. Well, the night of his invasion, and it was during, uh, you can read in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar got so drunk, God probably laid it on their hearts to forget about the gate. They left it open. The gates were open, doors were open, and they came in and they took over Babylon, just like God said 200 years earlier. Amazing what God can do. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by your name, am the God of Israel. The God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I highlighted that. He didn't even know God, and God was using him. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting, there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I formed the light, created the darkness. I made peace and created calamity. Now, your King James might say evil. God did not create evil, but he creates calamity. These are the things that God does. Here's the thing, guys. God is sovereign. You have a problem with God? Too bad. <laughs> he's God. He created you. He is your maker. He is in total control. Too bad if you have a problem with God. Too bad if you don't believe this. Because one day you'll stand before him. Every knee will bow before God. And they will confess him as Lord. Whether it's to depart from him because they're workers of iniquity or whether it's to enter into the kingdom of God. What we need to do is stop playing God Stop being in control and just relinquish everything to God. That is so hard to do, isn't it? It is so hard to do. Because we know it's the right thing to do. We know that God will take care of it, but it's hard to let go of those things. And we really need to let go. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down, you heavens, from afar or above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let the righteous spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. 
Woe to him who strives with his maker. You're not going to win if you're striving with your maker. If you're trying to be in control, you're not going to win. That's why you're having the problems you're having. That's why you're having the struggles you're having because you're not letting God. See, this is how it works. You have an encounter with God. I call, I call them transitions. There are transitions in life. Great transitions like the transition of Adam and Eve. Here they are in the garden walking with God. Everything they need and all of a sudden a transition happens. They sin. Whew. Something totally different now. They get kicked out. They no longer have a relationship with God in a personal way. It's a big transition in life. We all have transitions in life. We have a born again transition that takes place in our life. One day God opens up our eyes and we go, He's real. He's alive. He forgave me. Your heart is touched. You repent. You feel this connection to God, this forgiveness. You feel something come upon you. You feel this love. You feel this desire to serve God, to love God. You, you have this desire to, to do what God wants you to do. You want to do it from your heart. No one has to ask you. No one has to plead with you. We don't even have to make up rules that you should be here in church twice a week. You know, we don't even have to make up rules that you should be on time. You should be committed. We don't have to do any of that. Why? Because the Spirit of God is in you that says, I want to just do that stuff. That's a great transition, great transitions. But then you get older and you get lax and then you start striving with God. God, I don't really want to do that. Oh, okay. Well, I had some great plans for you if you wanted to do that, but I really don't want to do that. And now you're striving. And next thing you know is it's hurting you and your family, you know, because she's not as beautiful or as this other girl, and she's beautiful, and God, I know I'm not supposed to look, and you know, but, you know, and now you've created some problems, and it just starts affecting your family, it starts affecting the church, it starts affecting you, when God had already protected you, and we strive with God, instead of just being obedient to God's word, accepting his word as truth, and knowing that he has a perfect plan, because everything he's written down is for our good, so that we live a prosperous life, so that we have a wonderful life on this earth, you know, and we reflect Christ, our Savior. Let the potsherd uh, strive with the potsherd of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who formed it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say he has no hands? Or woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you begotten? Or brought forth. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and His Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. You command me. I have made the earth. I created man on it. Very clear. Man was created by God, not evolved. The earth was created by God, not evolved. I, my hand, stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts I have commanded. I have raised up in righteousness Cyrus. Now, he's speaking of Cyrus here. Righteousness Cyrus. And I, it doesn't say Cyrus in the text. I'm adding that in there for you. So Just so you're going, wait a minute, I don't see Cyrus anywhere there. <laughs> I'm adding that to, in there for you. I have raised him up in righteousness. I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free. Not for a price, nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. Now, if you read Ezra chapter 1, it's exactly what happened. Cyrus destroys Babylon. He's raised into power. And then all of a sudden, Israel comes in and says, Cyrus, we want to rebuild Jerusalem. Oh, okay, go. I'll give you everything you need. Go do it. It's like God restores them completely. God is in total control. I'm saying that up too much. Thus says the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Cush and of the Sabaeans, men of statutes, shall come over to you and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you, they shall come over in chains and they shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you saying, surely God is in you. Now this is again Cyrus. They're going to see this in Cyrus, that God is in him. And there is no other, there is no other God. Truly you are God who hides yourself. O God of Israel, the Savior there's the word Savior there. Go to Titus, go to Timothy, and when you read about God, our Savior, again, the Trinity there, they shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them, 
They shall go in confusion together who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth, and who made it? Who has established it? Who did not create it in vain? Who formed it to be inhabited? I am the Lord, and there is no other. God did not create this earth in vain, meaning in a worthless, for a worthless reason. There's a purpose behind it. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. You can take it to the bank, you can deposit it, and it's going to be there because God spoke it. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge. They carry the woods of carved images. <laughs> Again, they're idols. They don't speak. They don't see. They really have no knowledge at all. They're making it up as they go is what's happening. And pray to the God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Let, yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this? From ancient times. Who has told it from the time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved. All you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have shown. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. And shall not return. That to me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. Who does he swear by? Himself. I promise. Everything that I said, even in the future, will come true. Every knee will bow. Believe me, I swear to myself. Paul tells us in Hebrews that, that, that God made a promise to Abraham because he could not swear by anyone else because there is no one higher than him. He had to swear by his own name. You know, we always say, we swear to God. You know, it's the truth. You know, God says, hey, I swear by me. <laughs> you know, it's the truth. Believe me. And that's why Jesus could say, you know, I bear witness of myself and the Father bears witness of me. In other words, it's the truth and there is no higher. <laughs> Believe it or not. There's no mystery to it too. Remember that Ripley's Believe It or Not? There's always a mystery to that. It just came to me when I said that. You know, and they show you a mystery and you're going, is that real or not? And that's the whole premise of the show, right? To get you to look at it and go, whoa, that was amazing. I don't know if I believe that. Was it an illusion? Was it a trick? God's not saying believe it or not. God's saying it's the truth. It's the truth. Either you accept it or you don't and you suffer the consequences. He shall say, surely the Lord or in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incest against him in the lord all the descendants of israel shall be justified and shall glory and so in him surely in the lord i have righteousness and strength you believe that it's in the lord that you have power and strength it is in the lord one of the reasons that our nation is dying and i mentioned to you that monument is pointing up to god it's a reminder to us as a Christian nation that our nation is only here because of God. The reason that we're declining is because we're no longer pointing to God. Who are we pointing to? Man. So our nation is being built upon man's wisdom, and that's why it doesn't work. And so when you start something like Obamacare and your good intentions and hoping everybody gets insurance, it can't work because it's a man-made thing. It's a man philosophy, it's a man's wisdom, and it's going to be destroyed. No nation will ever stand without God. That's the only way a nation can survive is through God. How do I know this? Look at Israel. All the other nations around Israel are gone because they did not have God as their foundation or their faith. Israel had God as their foundation. When they were taken out of Egypt, they were brought to the Mount of Sinai, and God gave them the Ten Commandments and said, you shall live by these laws, and you shall be governed by me, and I will give you Moses as a mediator. And Moses then set up a, a, a system where he ruled the people. It was too much. He took faithful men of God who believed in the Word of God, trusted in the Word of God, preached the Word of God, and they gave wisdom, and they survived. Oh yeah, they had their hard times, but they came back to it. 
and they're going to come back later on. That's why our nation needs to go back to God. Any, anything else is sinking sand. It's going to be destroyed because we don't have the wisdom. I don't have the wisdom. For you to think to come to me that I have the wisdom and the understanding, you're wrong. Now, I may direct you to the wisdom and understanding, which is in the Word of God. And that's where you should go to, to find that wisdom and understanding. That's why our nation is where it's at. We need to get back to God. Our nation is great because of God and because we put our faith in God. And that's why we're still here today because there are people like us who believe in God, trust in God, and vote for our moral values, just like we have the opportunity in June. And I hope all of you are voting. I really do. It's a great opportunity to get involved in this world and what God has called us to do. Romans 13 makes it very clear that God uses righteous men in the government. Well, is our government righteous? Are there righteous men in our government? No. So then who is he speaking of? Christians. Christians. We need to be political. We need to be involved with those things in order to get our nation back. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart as it is falling apart today. Even our laws are all governed by evolution. Back in what, the, the 1800s when Darwin came in, all of a sudden they decided, you know what? Constitution has taken us so far. Wonderful, great, but I don't think it can take us to the future. We need to start asking people, what do they think? And so then their laws began to, to be formed around what the majority of people thought what was wise. Who became God? Who were the idols? Humanity. And guess what? We're flawed, aren't we? I'm flawed, guys. Believe it or not, I'm flawed. I'm selfish. You know, some of the... When, when I first think of things, the first thing I think of is self-preservation. How am I going to survive? What am I going to eat? How am I, you know, I got mad today because I went to go eat at Chipotle's and, you know, it's already expensive for, for $6 for lunch and all of a sudden it was 7 almost a dollar more. I'm like, wait a minute, what happened here? The prices go up? Yeah, since the 19th. A whole dollar for lunch? That's ridiculous. I was this because I thought of myself, you know, and how it affects me personally in the economy, and I can't afford it right now. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, Lord, you provide for me. You're the one that provides for me, not Chipotle, <laughs> nor myself. You are my provider, and I can't do it, but you can. And so we just put our faith back into him because that, we're flawed, we are flawed, and so we look to him. And that's why Peter says, and we'll see Sunday, that we have a chief shepherd. He's our chief shepherd. And Peter's encouraging the pastors of that time, shepherd the flock, because the chief shepherd has enabled you to do that. He's the one we look to. He is our God. He's where our faith and direction comes from, not from me. We need to look to him for that direction.